we're going to end today uh, with the sort of global look at the question that we started with this morning. And uh, we brought together a terrific panel of speakers. I'm actually, in the interest of saving time, uh, not going to recite everybody's biographies. Uh, you can Google them. You can look them up uh, on the conference website. Um, but just want to say that uh, it's a pleasure to have Evgeny Morozov, Ori Okolo, Cheryl Conti, and Ethan Zuckerman here. Uh, each, in their own way, are uh, global leaders, global thought leaders, activists, organizers. Um, and this is an ongoing conversation. Uh, what really is the, the role of the internet and interactive uh, communications tools and technologies in democratization around the world? To what degree are we seeing closed societies, people in closed societies, using these tools effectively um, to open them up, to change them, make them more transparent, accountable, participatory, small d democratic. And uh, for people who've been coming to PDF for, uh, from the beginning, I, I think it would be fair to say that we are optimists about this question of the possibility of positive change being fostered uh, as technology diffuses into the hands of more people through mobile, through internet, and so on. Um, but in the last two years, uh, and this is my way of setting up our first speaker, the way we're going to structure this is we're going to uh, ask each person to make a few remarks. Uh, but I'm really going to start with Evgeny Morozov, because in the last two years or so, a couple of years, uh, he has, I think, more than anybody, driven a very powerful set of counter arguments um, that are raising important questions uh, that many of us here are wrestling with uh, about whether we have been too optimistic, uh, whether there's been a bit too much uh, cyber utopian hype about uh, the role of the internet or uh, platforms like Twitter or Facebook in enabling dramatic social change, and that perhaps uh, we need to ask some hard questions of those theories um, and rethink. So what I want to do is start by asking you, Evgeny, to take a couple of minutes to kind of hit us with your best shot. Um, you have, you've got a new book coming out with the title, How Dictators Learn to Love the Internet. Is that the correct title? No, I think that's the temporary title. That's the temporary <laughs> title. How Dictators Have Learned to Love the Internet. That's pretty provocative. So why don't you start and uh, really give us the argument uh, that we have to hear, and then I'm going to ask it, more or less Ethan, Cheryl, Ori each to take a, a whack at, at uh, responding to your critique, and then we'll open it up. Sure. Well, look, I think democratization is a very broad term, and because it's so broad, it's very abstract, and it's very hard to understand what exactly what I mean by that. You know, when you look at what happened in Iran last summer, you know, what happened was people think, you know, collective action. It was people getting together, mobilizing, you know, trying to do something. Right? This is one part of a much bigger picture. Uh, you know, collective action, how people organize, how people mobilize, yes, it's very important. You know, again, what we know from political theory is that not all elections are followed by protests, not all protests result in revolutions, not all revolutions result in democracy, right? That's how it's going to be, I think, forever, right? So whether it is making it easier or harder to organize or mobilize doesn't really mean much. You have to look at the nature of the regime, you have to look at the role that elites are playing, you have to look at the vector of politics. It's much more complex than just looking at you know, whether it has become cheaper to send messages, right? So this is one small part, I think, that we need to look at. I think there are also longer-term, uh, you know, effects, which are also important. You know, whether the Internet is making it easier for the governments to track activists online. You know, whether it has certain features which makes it easier for, uh, you know, people working for propaganda departments of the government to spread their messages online, right? Uh, there are many other effects, and most of them, you know, do not revolve around protests or elections, right? So this is kind of a short-term view 
focused on protests versus a longer term view focused on kind of long term dynamics of authoritarianism. And on that long term view, I'm not at all yet sure that the internet has been a great revolutionary you know, force empowering the activists, empowering you know, the good guys to simplify it uh, you know, a lot. Um, but beyond that, there are also many other forces within each closed society you look at, you know, cultural, nationalistic, religious, which, if empowered, may not necessarily result in a peaceful democratization. You know, I'm not at all sure that if Facebook or Twitter was around in the early 90s, you know, there would be no bloodshed in Yugoslavia. You know, I'm not even sure there would be less bloodshed in Yugoslavia. Right? There would probably be more happening along ethnic lines. You know, looking at a place like Russia today, which has you know, dozens, hundreds of nationalities, all of which have been suppressed essentially for you know, seven decades, and in some cases even longer, nine decades, you know, you know, a century, you know, all of them suddenly are discovering a lot of nationalistic literature, which has been banned essentially since the early 20th century, which is now being scanned, it's resurfacing online, and it's contradicting the official uh, you know, Russian narrative of events, which of course was flawed, it was all written by communists, but it was effective at suppressing nationalism. You know, as those forces are being empowered and start fighting each other, which I think is inevitable, I'm not at all sure that we will just magically arrive at an outcome which will be, you know, more democracy, more diversity, more cosmopolitanism. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I'm not, uh, at this point, you know, I'm not saying that, um, you know, we should just, you know, stay away from this and do nothing. No, I think we should actually start countering. And by us, I mean, you know, people in the West and Western, you know, policymakers concerned with those issues. We should start countering many of those longer term uh, forces, uh, which do not necessarily promise much in terms of democratization. So what I've been trying to do in the last few years was to actually bring in a little bit more complexity and not just focus on the protest, you know, uh, angle and try to look beyond because you know, democratization is much more complex and it depends on so many forces, all of which are being multiplied and amplified by the internet. You know, and I'm just not sure how it is that we have arrived at the conclusion that suddenly, you know, uh, all of those forces will cancel each other out and we'll end up with, you know, more democracy, more participation. Fair enough, but I'm, I'm gonna just push back yes. briefly. If the title of your book is How Dictators Came to Love the Internet, the That's not going to be the actual okay, title. Fair. Program to Fail would be the actual title. Program I'll, I'll break to the Fail, news. okay. Yes. Well, the dictators in the internet <laughs> is kind of catchy. Um, <coughs> the implication, though, uh, is that you're in effect saying, in toto, that the, the add, add the internet to the equation, and it actually strengthens dictators more than it strengthens Democrats. And I, I, do you want to defend that position? I, if you want to reduce me to the you know soundbite level of television, yes, you know well, I would say that that it is. Uh, you know, if you want to look a little bit more complex, I just think you know it's it's too early and premature to draw conclusions. I think there are many different forces uh, which are being amplified, which eventually would strengthen authoritarianism. You know, I'm not sure we have completely understood the formation of political commitment under conditions of authoritarianism. You know, I'm not sure what has happened as a lot of young people in those countries got access to essentially free entertainment. Right? I'm not sure that that's a bargain which we fully understand. We don't even understand it fully in you know, the Western democratic context where you know, we often treat voters as irrational and ignorant and suddenly we think that you know, somehow all of those effects that modern media have would not happen in a authoritarian context, which I think is, uh, is a bit too naive. So, you know, I, I just don't see any benefits, frankly, in saying that, you know, it will empower the good guys because it blinds you to the consequences of how it empowers the bad guys. So yes, if you want me to choose a position, I'll side with the pessimists. Okay, Ethan. So I, I'm not gonna respond directly to what Evgeny's putting forth because a lot of people in this room have heard me respond very directly to what Evgeny's putting forth, but I want to try to give a broader answer and maybe um, give a voice sort of on, on how the U.S. is trying to work through these issues at the moment. One of the interesting things that's come up in the wake of last summer's protests in Iran is this wave towards interest in internet freedom. 
in the United States, which, first of all, let me just say is a, a dreadful, dreadful, dreadful term, right? It, it takes all these ideas of uh, exporting a freedom agenda and exporting it with military force and sort of puts it out there in the internet, but put that aside for the moment. The notion of internet freedom, as introduced by Hillary Clinton in a speech in February, is that the US, through the State Department, is going to push for an open internet in closed societies and look at the open internet as a way of leading towards political change, and one would assume democratization within closed societies. This is the sort of mom and apple pie thing that you can put out to the tech community, because everyone sort of looks at this and says, we've benefited massively from the open internet. Censorship is a bad thing. In fact, we sort of think of that as, as almost a central American value, that censorship is a bad thing. Let's figure out how to project a free and open internet into closed societies. Part of what I've been trying to suggest is that it's worth actually thinking through this. And I think this is where Evgeny and I sort of line up on this, which is thinking about the long term as well as the short term. Where, by the way, we're going to turn out to disagree is that I'm much more of an optimist in the long term than Evgeny is, but that's not hard to be. Um, so <laughs> looking at this, it's really useful to look at sort of what's immediately happened with people responding to the Iran elections protest by saying, let me build yet another tool to help Iranian dissidents get online and get around the firewall in Iran. And the truth is, people have been building circumvention tools since the late 1990s, like before China was censoring the internet. Before we were trying to worry about China, we were actually worried about schools censoring the internet. And it was people just trying to figure out how to get to websites that they were blocked from while they were at school. And we started building early circumventors. And the truth is the state of the art in this technology all works basically the same way. You say, hey, I can't get to the website I want to get to. I'm going to go to someone else, and they're going to get me to the website. And so all of these tools that are showing up and going to the State Department right now and saying, we're going to free China, we're going to free Iran, are using some variant of the same idea. We're going to proxy the internet for you. This turns out to be a problem. It's really, really hard to access the internet through a proxy. You can do it, it's unpleasant, it's slow, it doesn't work very well. It has some really nasty security implications because suddenly you can't see that I'm the person using a site, you see that the proxy is using a site. That's very useful for abuse, it's very useful for STAM, it's very useful for things like that. But this appears to be the strategy that we are sort of doubling down on right now, and it's an absurd strategy in the long term. If we really want China to have access to a free and open internet, we're essentially proposing proxying Chinese internet use through the United States, which is a little crazy as there are now more Chinese internet users than there are US citizens. So what we need to think about at a certain point is why are we doing this? Like what's our theory behind this? What do we think the free and open internet is really useful for? Because if we figure out what we're trying to do with it, then we can actually sort of optimize the way we're doing this. We could favor one use over another. Here are a couple of theories that I end up hearing out of Washington policy circles. One is what you could call the North Korea theory. If people in closed societies could only get information about how wonderful things are elsewhere, dictatorships will fall. And the reason I call it the North Korea theory is that North Korea is perhaps the only place in the world where this might possibly be true. The rest of the world is so thoroughly linked together by other networks other than the internet, particularly the phone network, that information gets in all the time. And actually in North Korea, information is getting in over the phone all the time. And the truth is that information, generally speaking, does not lead people to step up in the streets and overthrow corrupt governments, even when they find out how screwed up their government is. Information is part of the equation. It isn't the sole catalyst. Second theory you hear a lot, Twitter revolution theory. It's not going to happen, or it's not going to happen quite that way. Twitter is the worst conceivable tool to run a revolution on. I, I love Twitter. You've been watching me tweet during this, but this is an incredibly stupid place to plan your revolution because the government watches it too. And so when you go out, and, and this happened during um, the response to the Iran protests, everyone said, this is great. I'm going to start up uh, circumvention nodes. I'm going to put up computers. I'm going to free people in Iran. I'll post it on Twitter. So it was the only way that anyone could figure out how to get the information in there, where the government sat there and simply harvested the list and then blocked all of those nodes. This is probably not the way you mobilize people in the streets. And the tools that you mobilize people in the streets are the ones that really freak out the State Department. They're the secret ones, they're the clandestine ones, they're hidden services within Tor. So what is this actually useful for? It's useful for at least two things. The internet is marginally useful in a closed society 
to get voices out when they can't access other forms of speech. So it was certainly useful to be able to get the, the native video out, although the truth of the native video was that that isn't really so much an internet story, how it gets out. Native video was emailed out. It wasn't posted to a web 2.0 site. It wasn't posted to YouTube. You didn't circumvent your way around it. It's an internet tool, isn't it? It's an internet tool, but it's not one that you actually have to circumvent censorship for, Mihai, and this is my whole point of this. Iran didn't shut down the internet because it would have destroyed their economic base, and as long as you have the internet and email and the ability to send an attachment, the video gets out. You don't actually have to build new tools to do that. It does make it easier, it does make it more helpful, you have a better chance of representing yourself, and one of the things that works so well in the Iran Revolution was that so many people were tweeting in English, not necessarily the most representative voices out of the Iran Revolution, but the ones that we could understand, that it managed to sustain media interest over a long period of time, and that's one way that we manipulate. The way that I think it really changes things in the long term is that you're creating a new public space, and you're creating a public space that, if getting is correct, can get occupied by the ultranationalists and the religious extremists, but it's a public space that in most closed societies is not available any other way. It's not available through the traditional press, it's not available through getting onto the radio, and my hope, and it's a hope, it's not necessarily a, a firm assertion, is that having that open platform allows a debate between ideas that isn't in many cases taking place in other places within these societies. So I look within a country like Egypt, and I don't so much look to see the Muslim Brotherhood run for elections you know, based on their campaign on Twitter, what I look for instead is Kaleni Lela, which is a movement that's been going on to try to empower Egyptian women to talk about sexual harassment and discrimination, which is largely a taboo topic in normal civilized conversation, but has become a mainstream conversation. So my take on this is the reason you try to figure out how to bring a free and open internet into a closed society is that you're trying to create this public space. And what that means is don't look for the Marxist-Leninist, we grab our laptops and we take to the streets revolution. You're looking for a long, slow, gradual establishment of a digital public space, the training of the next generation of people who are gonna rise up and build a movement. And I will just say, the nice thing about asserting this theory is that it'll be at least 20 years before Evgeny can prove me wrong, and by that point he will have forgotten that this conversation took place. <laughs> It'll be on the internet, though. <laughs> Cheryl. Yes, well, take? thanks, Miha. Uh, I'm also on the side of the optimists, only because I've seen it in my own personal life. Uh, I believe that the internet can't fix politics, but that it is changing how the game is played because there are new players, and I'm one of those new players. I'd like to quote Gandhi, who said, even the most powerful cannot rule without the cooperation of the ruled. I'd also like to quote Homer Simpson, who said, yeah, children are our future, unless we stop them first. <laughs> right? <laughs> Which, you know, sounds funny, but when I first launched Jack and Jill Politics, uh, which is one of the top African-American blogs today, um, my mother was really concerned and wanted me to stop and, and said, you know, I'm, I'm concerned for your welfare. You know, what if this ruins your career and people don't like what you're saying, you know, what if somebody firebombs your house? What, you know, what if you're beaten up in the streets? And, and those were legitimate concerns considering that you know, the United States wasn't always an open society from the perspective of African Americans and that in the past there have been real political and personal repercussions for being outspoken. During slavery, it was forbidden to teach slaves how to read and write because it kept them in a childlike state and it prevented them from communicating with each other and from self-educating and self-organize, self-organizing. You know, when I founded Jack and Joe Politics, I knew I was doing something really dangerous um, that might have repercussions, but I didn't care. And I think that there are a lot of other people like that in the world who are like me, who say, you know, I'm willing to take the chances of the government looking at what I'm doing and maybe trying to stop me. Because it's like Spartacus, you can't kill everyone. You can't jail everyone. You can't torture every person. When we look at something like Tiananmen Square, Tiananmen Square, the, on the list of seven demands that the students and intellectuals had, number three was we want uh, freedom of speech, 
and we want an independent press. Now, a lot of those people got jailed or trampled by tanks or otherwise suppressed. But today, there are 30 million, over 30 million Chinese bloggers. They do have that freedom press. That's, to me, really astounding. I'm really inspired by the work of, of Ori with Mzalendo, where you've got Kenyans who are able to speak directly and dialogue with members of parliament, something that wasn't possible before. Today, the descendants of slaves, three or four generations out, now not only can they read and write, but they have new technology with which to speak. 25% of the people on Twitter are African Americans. I think that's astonishing and, and really incredible. It's twice our population rate, and of course, you know, many times our, our population um, in the United States. The digital divide is closing, and what's happening is that people are able to talk and dialogue in ways with these tools. One third of Africans have mobile phones. They're able to actually use Google Africa in several countries to get information about banana weevils. But they're also able to text message their local newspapers in some countries and have those text messages published. So the watcher is now the watched. When we live in a universe where the people in Iran can, even if all the foreign journalists are, are arrested or you know, blocked in their hotel rooms from taking footage, they can go directly to the rest of the world and show us what's happening there. Now the game is changed because the players are different and we have fewer intermediaries between one another. To me, I'm optimistic there. I think that here in the United States, we have a special responsibility, uh, in part because we have gone through the pains of being a closed society in many ways and restricting the speech of some, and also because we were the creators and, and remain some of the leading managers of the internet. How many people here are actually members of the Internet Society? Do you even know what the Internet Society is? The Internet Society is actually what runs the internet. Anyone in the world can join the Internet Society. If you're really concerned about how the internet can be used to suppress people, why not join the Internet Society, participate in the Internet Architecture Board, and, and make sure that freedom of access is, is built into the system, into the DNA. In short, I'd like to quote someone else. It's not Homer Simpson. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's Paul Hawken, who is a great thinker. And he said, inspiration is not garnered from the recitation of what is flawed. It resides rather in humanity's willingness to restore, redress, reform, reimagine, and reconsider. That is the human story. Pol the internet's not going to fix politics, folks. That's not going to happen. However, you know, even though politics have been with us from the Sumerians, the time of the Sumerians, the times of the Romans, we're no longer ch chiseling things into stone and, and passing that around. We're able to self-organize and self-educate in ways never before possible, and that is accelerating change. We live in a world where three generations, I am the third generation of my family out of slavery, and now we have a black president. And Jack and Jill Politics is one of the blogs that helped make that happen. So I, I respectfully push back on you. And I think that people are creative enough and ingenious enough to overcome if they really want power and they want to rule in cooperation with the ruled to overcome any boundaries in their way. OK. Ori, you get to back clean up. <laughs> and then I'm going to let Ev Evgeny sort of sweep back and, and respond to some of these comments. Um, but in, in particular, I want Ori, if you would, Say a little bit about uh, your experience in Kenya, in particular, uh, if you can take us to the microcosm of the way that the net has, has or hasn't helped improve the prospects for a real democracy there. I think um, before I get into what's happening in Kenya, maybe I'll speak primarily from my own personal experience and try and bring the personal back into the personal democracy forum. Because I think that's something that we ignore <coughs> a lot and get, uh, and, and which is some of what Evgeny tries to do. We get seduced by the power of tools and, and, and the power of technology and forget that it's actually the people who um, are inspired or affected by those tools 
and it's the people who actually effect change. So when I think about personal democracy, it's about how it's been for me as an individual and not necessarily what impact that has had on Kenyan politics because I think that's a bit naive to expect uh, just the internet alone to fix politics. And, and there are a couple of points I want to make under that. I think first, um, <clears throat> someone spoke earlier this morning about being aware of our positions of privilege when we interact with technology, whether it's based on race or social status, um, or how much money you have, or the, the digital divide. I think f for me, I've actually used technology to gain privilege. Um, and, and what do I mean by that? Um, if you look at all the boxes that I check, black, female, African, how I grew up, um, probably a person with very little access either to get editorials in the paper or, or to do the kinds of things that money or, or, or status can allow you to do. But I studied over time how people have been able to use technology to gain a voice, whether it's through blogging, whether it's through um, doing activism work, whether it's how you position yourself. I used to joke that when I grow up, I want to be like Bono and speak for Africa, right? Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and now, you know, I've grown up and uh, I find myself speaking for Africa, which is kind of funny. Um, but, but the point was, uh, being a bit facetious, the point is, is how, how, how are these people able to position themselves to have such influence and how can me as an individual who's not had access to this, uh, to the kinds of resources, I'm not a celebrity, but how can I use technology then to give voice to issues that bother me or um, to get into good schools? Now something you take for granted in the US, uh, if you've had parents who've gone to college or friends and college guidance counselors and they give you the lowdown on how to get into Ivy League schools. Um, I went to Harvard Law School, and part of it was my grades, but part of it, I spent a lot of time trawling message boards, uh, including Princeton Review and, and all these places where students had access and people, because of their positions of privilege, had lots of little tidbits about the law school application process that are generally not available to people who don't have guidance counselors, who don't have parents who went to Ivy League schools. And that changed how I viewed the application process mm. um, and, and gave me little insider clues and tips that probably helped me get into a better school than I would have gotten before. But my main point is, is, is just using, tech. for me, that's personal democracy. How I've been able then to break into spaces that people, that I wouldn't ordinarily have been able to without technology. Another example, everyone who pitched here in the previous session, I think was pretty much white male. Um, you know, and, and I've been able to now be involved in two projects using technology from my bedroom, literally. Again, as an atypical person who is you know, in a startup position or social entrepreneur position using technology. Again, to me, that's how I define personal democracy. I'm able to be atypical without leaving my house, without, you know, just, again, using technology and being smart about um, getting resources, connecting with people, et cetera. And, and, you know, again, it's not about just how can we change governments, but how can you change individuals? And if you look at what Africans are doing now in the tech space, in the mobile space, again, it points to that you're seeing a lot more diversity in terms of what we're doing with, with the internet, with tech, then you can you even see reflected in the United States. And I think that's an important point. Um, I think finally, when we talk about closed governments, it's not just about, oh, when you talk about closed societies, it's not just about censorship. Um, you know, Kenya is very much a closed society, although we, we are allowed to speak freely and there's a relatively free press and, um, but in other ways, in terms of, okay, so what information exactly does the government put online and how easy is that to get? Or how open is it for a woman? Uh, most people, because you can't tell from my name when I started blogging, thought I was a guy because obviously African women can't write about politics or can't be involved in politics. So again, changing those perceptions and those barriers and the signaling that I then send out to other young women about being involved in tech and politics. It's not just about break, you know, dealing with censorship or circumventing censorship 
or, or using technology and the, the reaction that then dictators would have, I say it's also then, can you send other different signals um, around the role of women, the role of, of, of homosexual gay people now is, is, is a really huge debate going on in Africa right now. But you have a lot more gay bloggers coming on and people interacting with them and seeing actually, you know what, it's, it's, you, you know, these are people we can relate to, we share the same concerns. And, and so I'd like us to, to, when we think about clothes, not just about censorship, but can tech then allow people to open up spaces in other areas? Age is another issue. 70% um, of the Kenya population is 30 and under. When I started out with Mzalenda, everyone is like, but who's, getting, who's visiting this website? And I'm like, I'm not building for this generation. I'm building for the next voters, who they're definitely going to be a Google generation. Google search is the first place they go to, um, to look for information. I was in Kibera, which is the largest um, slum in Africa a few months ago. And I, I met, uh, I was talking with a group of um, 15, young people who are working on a project called Voices of Kibera. And I'll just end on this note and, and ask them how many of them use their phones to get onto the internet. Uh, all of them did, which is something that you wouldn't expect. And one of them told me actually, when and most of them buy secondhand phones, they say the first criteria for whether you're going to spend your money on a phone is to ask the person trying to sell it to them is can this phone get onto Facebook? Um, wow. <laughs> and, yeah, and this is now, you know, slum, like very little income, like, but, but that's the number one criteria. And the second question then is then show me how to use this phone to get onto Facebook because I've been hearing about this Facebook thing. Uh -huh. And so if, you, you know, I want to be ready for them when they do get online, that Zalendo and all these other projects that I'm involved in be ready to meet them onto the internet. Okay. So we have a little more than 10 minutes. Uh, let's talk about the next generation. Let's, let's, sure. I'm going to give you a chance, I'm going to need to answer, of course. But, so, since everybody has talked about the next, the young, uh, so let's project a little bit forward, uh, whether the trends are positive or negative. Sure. Well, look, I mean, I like Ori's story, and I think it's a great example of personal democracy, you know, in action. The thing is that I can tell you exactly the same story, how I was trolling, you know, internet boards to go study abroad, and, you know, my current contribution to political life in Belarus, where I come from, is zero. Uh, you know, so the only way you can actually analyze those is through some sort of, you know, framework which will also take note of the brain drain and all other social and political factors. And the fact that we're being empowered is great, but, you know, if you look at it on a country level, and that's the level in which I look at it, it's not necessarily all for the good, right? It doesn't mean that it's all for the worse, but, you know, you, you do need more subtlety, uh, you know, from the social and macro level. Uh, can I quickly respond to Ethan? Uh, I actually think all this talk about theories of change with regards to the internet is futile because there are already existing theories of change about how we promote democracies, democracy in general, and those theories have been in place for 20, 30 years, and the only way you can make the internet relevant is actually make sure that you embed it into those theories. Some of them, yes, have to do with fostering civil societies. Have they been overstated? I think yes. You know, have dissidents played a huge role in bringing down the Soviet Union? Personally, I think no. Uh, does it mean we shouldn't have been supporting dissidents? No, we should have been supporting them. But everything that Clinton wanted to say, and I think her advisors wrote a terrible speech to basically communicate one message, was that we need to make sure that freedom of expression is preserved online, and that you know people who want to send on the internet wouldn't be able to do so either because we'll you know impose trade sanctions of them or we'll use some other tools. From that perspective, yes, it was a good speech. It was freedom of the internet. You know, the thing is that, yes, it's a terrible concept and it opens up so many interpretations like freedom via the internet, you know, which do not necessarily sound, uh, you know, exciting to many people in countries who actually want to export democracy, right? So, you know, what I would actually propose is not to try to, you know, position the internet as some kind of exceptional tool, which now we need to, you know, completely redefine everything else we do, but to try to think how it fits or doesn't fit existing theories. Because the problem is that what Egypt needs is not new tools, you know, for circumvention. It needs for the U.S. to stop funding the Mubarak regime. You know, you can start creating as many tools as you want, but this is not where the main problem lies. So my problem is that we'll just be distracting from everything else that needs to be tackled. Fair point. Ethan, do you want to? So 
the talk that I'd hoped to give, and, and, and you know, I, I, I misunderstood how, uh, how Miho wanted to, to frame this. So the talk that I was going to give was actually answering your next critique of Getty, which was, and the good news is it's up on my website, and you can read it or you can not read it. I and, did. And I know you did. <laughs> I, I made it more for the audience. I'm trying to expand the conversation between us because, you know, we actually talk amongst ourselves quite often. But um, the, the reason that I think it's useful to think in terms of theories of change is that an enormous amount of what goes on at a conference like this is about strategies and tactics. Uh, we're coming up with new tools and clever new ways to use them, and there's an assumption that we have a theory of change behind it because we're trying to accomplish certain things generally within the frame of US politics. I think particularly when we get into this realm of trying to use the internet in closed societies, we in many cases aren't using functioning theories of change. And we like, show them, that's the- Well, so again, and this might be where we disagree. I, I, I think it's great that hundreds of thousands of Americans turn their Twitter's icons green. I think it's great that they wanted to show affiliation, but one of the reasons it wasn't particularly effective was it wasn't harnessed into any form of movement to use any of these theories that have been in place for 20, 30, 50 years to try to figure out how you move a movement forward. And where I would love to see this field and the sort of people in this room going is to take these tactics and strategies that we're developing here and start working with people who've been working on very difficult forms of political change in closed society for 20, 30, 50 years and try to figure out if what social media does well, which is to let people affiliate, which is to spread certain types of information, and which is occasionally to be able to infect that information into mainstream media, how that can be useful in some of these older, longer struggles like trying to figure out what you do about the junta in Burma. Um, but what I think often happens is we hear about something, we think that's really awful, we wanna do something, we're really big on participating, and we do something that has a marginal utility of nothing. And so my question is, how do we take this passion and this energy, which could be harnessed in some helpful ways, and rope it into some of these existing theories, because I, ultimately I think change is possible, and I think that we're obligated to try to figure out how to do it more effectively. Mm. Mm. Yeah, just... Ori? Um, um, to build off on your point, um, I was having a conversation with a, a group that's um, going to be, that does a lot of great video content called Kuwani Serious, and they're behind them, a Mende viral character. Uh, they were saying, they're doing a series of readings now, we're having a constitutional referendum in Kenya in, in a few months. And they said, you know what, there's um, a lot of activism around grassroots and the people, um, and, and reaching out to them and focus mainly in the rural areas in Kenya. But no one is really talking to the middle class and, and no one is really engaging in the middle class which has, you know, traditionally was pretty much decimated under Moy, but now, you know, is, is back. And those are the people you sort of want to care actually the most. And it's, it's a dirty word to say, to say that, you know, mass democracy actually doesn't change things, it's elite. Because once you have people with salaries, with properties that they care about, um, with, uh, you know, they're, they're worried about their schools getting, and we, we saw this during the post-election violence in Kenya, is that they were, they, the middle class was, you know, st at the end of the day, especially in Nairobi, not really, or, or, or more so the, the rich and middle class, not really touched. And so they were the, the quickest to say, okay, the violence is over, let's get on with it, let's go to peace and, and, and let's move on without addressing the underlying sort of issues. And the point was then how to bring them, who's advocating with them, who's getting them to care about the issues, who's getting them engaged in politics, and, and linking then those challenges and, and looking at is, is social media then a better way to reach, it might not work for the people in rural Kenya, but segmenting, they're not saying can internet change Kenyan politics, but can the internet be used to reach a particular segment of, of people who can then affect Kenyan politics. And I think there's a need then of linking people who do advocacy w with the tech and being a bit more, going back to his point, and, and not just broad brushing and saying that, you know, let's use internet to advocate, but can you be both sophisticated about the limitations, but also the opportunities and, and say, are there segments where it's a lot more effective than in, in, in other segments, I right. think. Sure. 
Yeah, and I disagree that the Iranian Twitter revolution was completely ineffective. I think you know two things happened. One is that a government, despite its best efforts, was delegitimized in, in the eyes of the world by its own people, and that was a big deal. Two, before, under the Bush administration, Iran was called an axis of evil, and, and our societies were positioned against them. And all of a sudden, you had Iranians talking to other people around the world, and we found out they weren't so evil after all. And that, I think, it was a watershed moment. Of course, in the short run, right, I agree that you know, there's not going to be a Marxist-Leninist moment where everything falls apart. But, you know, and I think we've seen here in the United States that the negotiation of power sharing, you know, there are ups and downs. There are, you know, it's not a smooth path. It's crooked. I mean, here in the United States, there are people who are talking about rolling back parts of the Civil Rights Act. I mean, that's, that's nego you know, people who are uncomfortable with power sharing and want to renegotiate. I think that we're going to see that at the same time, you know, the, you know, the genie's out of the bag now. Um, and you know, with mobile phones in particular, you know, we're gonna see augmented reality where people wear glasses and you immediately are able to see a lot of information about the person in front of you, whether they're How is it a good thing in cool, well, cool I think society? That's, you know, in terms of augmented reality and being able to, yeah. to see, I, I think it, it's a double-edged sword and I agree with you that there are some challenges. Better, right? I think there are, <laughs> right, there are some challenges, but at the same time, I think also all of this information really does help us cross over and self-educate and self-organize much more quickly than ever before, and that's unstoppable. Right, I, I actually, I, and I'm gonna, as the, as the moderator, I'm gonna t steal the prerogative of getting the last word, and, and also make sure that we get out of here on time so we can all go enjoy a really nice party. Um, but the sense I get, and, and this is uh, building on conversations that Ethan and I have had, is that actually that we are still arguing too much from anecdotes, and that we don't have a good taxonomy uh, so that we can begin to say, what are the conditions when the, the freedom of expression and the freedom of connection that the internet can bring to societies that have not had that much, um, when does it act as a catalyst or, or, or as, uh, speed up a process of change that might otherwise have been very slow? The, the, for me, the seminal example is Korea, South Korea, where you had a very conservative media uh, system, d three newspapers that were basically dominated discourse, and along comes uh, a Oh My News, which is a very populist, open, you know, I mean, the Huffington Post isn't close to what they are. Um, and they helped drive a populist movement, a populist president into power, and then defend him against impeachment. Um, now, that may be the best case scenario where the, the, the conditions combined. But to me, I think what we need as a community is much more fine-grained research so that we can begin to say the cases where it has been more positive than negative. And then, thanks to the, the uh, intervention of people like Evgeny, also address the fact that in many cases it is not helping and maybe the powers that be are using it to greater effect to cement their position, which is, after all, what people try to do when they're in power, than the people who would open things up. So a lot of food for thought here. Our time is up. I know not to stand in the way of a good party. So thank you to our panel. Thank you to the audience for staying with us. <laughs>